discussing the news and making sense of a nation on the go. You're listening to The Long Form with Sunny Nyombia. This podcast is brought to you by The New Times. Hello, everyone. The news last week has not made for pretty viewing. Right here in Rwanda, a mammoth relief effort is currently underway in the northern and western province as a result of the disastrously heavy rains that fell between the nights of the 2nd and 3rd of May. Further afield, a deadly civil war in Sudan has erupted. The war that kicked off on the 15th of April is pitting two factions of the Sudanese military government against each other. And in Uganda, a state minister in charge of labor was shot and killed by his bodyguard on the 2nd of May. All while the MK movement formally met President Museveni to discuss their quote-unquote work. This week, we tried to answer the question, who is at fault for the floods and landslides? What is the biggest lesson that we can take away from the Sudanese conflict? And lastly, how close is Uganda to a civil conflict itself? That is the conversation today. Now, if you want to react to this conversation, use the hashtag longformrw on Twitter and share your thoughts. But before we continue, do you know what you need to do today? You need to join the over 40,000 daily subscribers of the New Times e-paper to enjoy credible, in-depth reporting on Rwanda. Visit the website newtimes.co.rw to register for free. And now, back to the show. As of the 5th of May, 131 people have died, 94 people have been injured, and one person is still missing. 5,359 homes have been destroyed, and 8,259 people have had to be evacuated. In terms of national infrastructure, 14 national roads, 8 water plants, and 12 power stations have been damaged. This report from Al Jazeera English gives us a snapshot of what exactly has happened. This is how people in Rwanda's western province start their day. Attempting to save whatever they can from their ruined homes. Muddy waters from Tuesday night's landslide still flow through Rubavu district, one of the hardest hit areas. Those who managed to escape the deluge described what they experienced. I was in bed. Suddenly my house moved and I thought it was the wind mixed with rain. Just as I was thinking what to do, the water was gone and the walls of my house were destroyed. I was saved by a neighbor and ran with my children. The rain was coming down heavily through the windows. I saw a neighbor house falling down and the old man living in it died. All of a sudden, the water and the river attacked us everywhere and the houses fell down one by one and we fled. Rescue crews are having a hard time getting to those most affected. Blocked main roads severely hampering rescue efforts. President Paul Kagame tweeted his condolences, saying his government will do everything within its means to assist. The governor of the Western Province, where most of the deaths are being reported, says his officials have prioritized reaching damaged houses to make sure no one is trapped. Those hoping for some relief from the downpours will have to wait. The Rwanda Meteorology Agency is warning more rain is to come. Al Jazeera. The rains hitting the northern and western provinces are the heaviest in recent memory. The question that we must ask ourselves is this. Was this a one-off or are we going to see more of the same? Personally, I believe that what we're seeing is a real-time effect of climate change. We're seeing hotter dry seasons, rainier wet seasons, strange weather patterns, more infrastructure damage, higher incidences of pests destroying crops, like the infamous uh, fall armyworm that uh, decimated hectares upon hectares of maize, and really, at the end of the day, more sickness and death. The question that we must ask ourselves is this. Who exactly is at fault here? It's certainly not us. When we look at uh, who's at fault, we're probably looking at industrialized countries that actually emit the greenhouse gases that are actually causing global warming. But it's not just enough that we are able to identify them. It's not just enough that we can say that it's Germany and Canada and the U.S. that is causing greenhouse gases, that are emitting greenhouse uh, gases. We have to ask ourselves, what can be done? I think there are literally just two things that can really be done here. One, we can 
hope that industrialized countries will stop polluting, right? And that one could be called mitigation or it's called mitigation in uh, climate speak. And secondly, we can hope that poorer nations will be given the means to deal with this climate change. And that one, we can call it uh, climate adaption. These two issues bring us to, I guess, the elephant in the room, and that is climate justice. Right now, those who are destroying the planet are not the ones who are being affected negatively by what they do. The Americans and the English, because of the Industrial Revolution, because they had to cut down all their trees, they caused climate change. But at the end of the day, those who are going to suffer from this is people like us. It's uh, poor countries that did not cause this climate change. We're just minding our own business. And our farmers in the Western region are now dealing with all this. It's not our fault that we're suffering this way, but it's, it's happening to us. At the end of the day, there needs to be some kind of climate reparations. But how do you force these, I guess, bully countries, these big countries to do their part, to play their role, to either stop polluting or pay for the damage they've caused to us poor countries or even do both. It's always really, really hard to make powerful people change their minds or to change their programs. But the only way that I think that we'll be able to actually ever get climate justice is if we, as those who are affected by the climate change, create a large coalition against those who are damaging the planet. So I'm thinking the AU, not just one African country, not just Egypt, not just uh, Uganda, but all the 50 plus nations of Africa coming together in one voice, one strategy and saying something needs to change. We need to get back what is owed to us. And I'm not just saying Africa. I think there has to be a larger global coalition. You have to get the South Americans involved. We need to get the Asians involved. We need to get the young people in the West, people like Greta Thunberg and organizations to create that kind of larger coalition that will then create real and sustained pressure on political leaders and global businesses. I'm just going to throw out a crazy idea here. The West has opened the Pandora's box of the word sanctions. They sanction everyone. If they don't like you, they'll give you sanctions. If, you know, there's something happening in Ukraine, they're sanctioning the Russians. If there's something happening in uh, Zimbabwe, they'll sanction the Zimbabweans. Maybe this larger coalition of African states, South American states, I can only imagine, and of course this is a pipe dream, if we could actually ever say to these emitters, if you don't stop emitting. We will not buy your goods anymore. If you don't give us what is owed to us, we're going to push back. We will not I'll vote for you and or vote for your interests in the UN Security, um, the UN General Assembly, sorry, not the Security Council. We're not even there. But this idea of waiting for these emitters to kind of give us climate justice, it's not working. I don't think that us sitting down in the COPs will really change anything. They'll promise to support African states and then you won't really see it happen. Or they'll promise to give us billions of dollars and we might get just tiny bits of that. So the only way to really tackle this issue is for us to push back as a larger coalition. That might be harder than it looks, but there is no other way. And uh, before I go to the next topic, I also uh, want to encourage all my listeners to go to the Ministry of Disaster Preparedness uh, Twitter. There is a campaign right now to support those who are uh, in, in pain, those uh, whose lives have been destroyed. Um, if you have a few extra coins in our culture, we, we, we help those who are in need. Please give what you can. Uh, if you go to the Twitter of uh, the Ministry of Disaster Preparedness, you, you can find platforms where you can uh, give what you can. Before we continue this very interesting conversation, are you looking for a job or is there a tender you want to bid for? On the New Times Job Mart, you will find hundreds of jobs and tender listings. Visit the Job Mart today by going to its website, jobs.newtimes.co.rw. If you want to post a job opportunity, call 07 85 and ask about the great rates. And now back to the show. On one side of the Sudanese Civil War is the paramilitary rapid support forces which numbers 100,000 soldiers strong. And on the other side is a regular army that has over 109,000 armed men. And in between these forces are the civilians. Today, over 500 people have lost their lives so far. 
Here's how Al Jazeera explains it. Let's talk about what's happening in Sudan. Rival forces remain locked in a power struggle despite international calls for a ceasefire. It's an all-out battle for control of the country between Sudan's army and a paramilitary unit known as the Rapid Support Forces, the RSF, led by men who used to be allies. Hundreds of people have been killed and hundreds have been injured. There's fighting in different parts of Sudan, but it's heaviest in the capital, Khartoum. There have been attempts at a ceasefire, but they haven't lasted. There have been air attacks and shelling. The airport has been severely damaged. There's no running water or electricity. Supplies of food are running low. This ridiculous battle that has civilians caught in the middle. And we have nothing to do with this. I personally don't believe that there has been a rigorous enough examination of the forces that would be unleashed onto the Sudanese people as a result of the ouster of the former Sudanese president Omar al-Bashir in a coup d'etat in 2019. Today, as a result of all these things, Sudan is crumbling as powerful men fight over who will reign supreme. Maybe we shouldn't have been surprised. Since independence in 1956, it has undergone six military coups. In fact, I'm pretty sure that there's been a civilian government for less than 10 years at a stretch. So it's just been military, coup, military, another coup, maybe a transitional government, then another military coup. So Sudan has been really at war, so much so that just a few decades or so ago, it was split into north and south because of those issues in the country. That's what it's been like since independence, right? So many naively thought that the military would then replace their swords with plowshares and sing kumbaya as, you know, the middle class created a liberal Western European type of government, a democracy, right? So we've We've removed uh, big bad uh, Omar al-Bashir and all of a sudden, uh, you know, all these generals with their troops and those paramilitaries, they would somehow, you know, just slink away into the darkness. I personally think that was a mistake. And today that there is proof of that. I think when we look at what's happening today, we should have seen all of this coming. We'd seen what had happened in Libya. They removed Gaddafi. There was that siren song of democracy and power of the people and this despot and everything will be great now that this uh, military leader has gone. And it's a terrible, terrible situation. Right now in Libya, you even have slave markets, right? So you have slave markets, you have people being kidnapped. It's just a total mess. It's from one day being a country that could have been first world. Today, there are very few people who would want to actually go there and pay, pay them a visit. Sometimes I think that the siren song of democracy makes us blind to the inherent risks of navigating a post-military political dispensation, right? So the issues of having military leadership. So we think, okay, let's remove them and somehow things will just work. I personally don't think that makes a lot of sense. I think that there should be dialogue with the old guard and maybe a slow and steady transition because speed of execution in Sudan's case was made paramount, right? It was more about revolution and not evolution. And for me, I always think that change for its own sake is quite dangerous, especially when all the forces at play are ignored. When I look at Sudan, I see it as a lesson for Africa when it comes to our political transitions or how we do political transitioning. As Africans, we need to ensure that political transitions are systematic and inclusive. And more importantly, it needs to be at our speed, not anyone else's, because as quick as they are to prop you up and rush your political process, and when I say this, I mean the West, they are faster still at packing their bags and flying home at the very first sign of trouble. We Rwandans learned that lesson in 1994. Libyans learned that in 2011. And now our Sudanese brothers and sisters are learning that lesson today. It is my fervent hope that no other African has to learn that lesson. We Rwandans, Libyans, and Sudanese have already paid that price. We've given that lesson. So I really, really hope we don't see another Sudan. I'm praying for the people of Sudan, hoping that clearer minds win, but I'm really, really worried. And I think there are going to be darker days ahead. And before we go, I want to talk about one last story. We have the shocking story of the death of Uganda's Minister of State for Labor, retired Colonel Charles Okello Ngola. Here is a new vision story with the details of the murder that took place on the 2nd of May. 
Retired Colonel Charles Okelo Engola, who has been the state minister for labor, employment and industry relations, was shot dead at his home today morning by his UPDF military guard at his residence in Chanja at Kampala suburb. <laughs> The UPDF bodyguard, after killing the late Angola, went on a shooting spree, shouting out his grievances. The bodyguard, Private Wilson Sabiti, also shot his fellow UPDF guard before he walked to a nearby saloon and shot himself dead. I see. Right. Addressing journalists today at the weekly press conference held at the police headquarters in Naguru, the police spokesperson Fred Enanga confirmed the shooting and sent his condolences to the bereaved family, the president, the cabinet, the people of Lango sub region, and Ugandans. This news gave me a huge pause for thought. While ministers are getting shot by their very guards, citizens are decrying potholes in Kampala and bad health services. So there's a whole like social media campaign around uh, potholes and health services. Then around the very same time, President Museveni is meeting his son and members of his controversial MK army to discuss God knows what. All the while, MPs are signing draft laws against homosexuality that will not only make Uganda a pariah, but will guarantee that they lose hundreds of millions of dollars in overseas development assistance. To be honest, it doesn't feel like there's a good captain piloting the Ugandan ship right now. And sometimes when we think about countries, right, we sometimes think that they're too big to fail. But while a country can go on autopilot for quite a while longer, I feel like the fate of Zimbabwe should be a lesson to us all. You are not too big to fail. When we look at Zimbabwe, it was a breadbasket of Africa. They had a really educated population. They had a stability. They had a great middle class. They were good in sports. They had minerals. They had gold and all sorts of good things. The ZANU-PF and Zimbabwe, they did not transition from him. And, you know, there was infighting and this and that, all the way to the point where he's a 90-year-old man, he can barely stay awake, and his wife is now the power that be, and then his old comrades from the army of, of the Freedom Fighter days are like, we're not happy with this person, we cannot have Grace Mugabe as our next president. All of a sudden, there's a coup d'etat, and you know when there's a coup d'etat, things can go right or left. We're thinking, oh my God, there's going to be a, an amazing thing. Zimbabweans are happy. Happy, they're on the street today. I'm pretty sure that if you were to ask most Zimbabweans, more than 80% of them would say, we wish we had done things differently. We're not happy where we are. And when I look at Uganda, I kind of feel the same sense of inertia. You have Museve on one side, you know, he's getting older and older and older. And on the other side, you have a population that's growing younger and younger and younger. He's talking about there was Idi Amin Dada and, you know, Obote One and these Kids are like, no, we were born in 1990. Don't give us stories of Amit Dada. We need jobs today. We want opportunities today. There's a lot, I feel like a sense of inertia there and different political forces. And obviously you have on one side all these different things. And it's getting to that stage where as political observers, we cannot think that somehow this is going to continue forever. This is getting scary personally. And as everyone knows, Uganda is not just the breadbasket of East Africa. It, it's also a guarantor of a lot of security in the region. So you have Ugandan troops in Somalia, you have Ugandan armed forces in South Sudan as well. Uganda is a linchpin to stability in this region. And a lot of it is under Museveni. If he is losing a step, what does that mean? If his UPDF are starting to shoot their the masters, it starts getting scary. And uh, I feel like there's something that needs to be said. We need to really watch what's happening in Uganda. I encourage all my listeners to, uh, you know, keep their eye on Uganda because you just never know. You never know. I think Zimbabwe is a great lesson. And as I said, no one is too big to fail. And with that, dear listeners, this is the end of the show. Thank you so much for listening. I can't wait to talk to you guys again next week. And I will promise to have an amazing guest. Goodbye, everyone. Before we leave, would you like to partner with The Long Form? Send an email to sales at newtimesronda.com and ask for our rates. If you enjoy this show, subscribe to The Long Form with Sunny Nayombia on your favorite podcast service. You can find us on Spotify, Apple, and Amazon Music, as well as the New Times website. 
Until next week, goodbye.